Uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk about it's a pretty controversial topic, so I'm going to talk about 10 reasons why you should prefer PostgreSQL to MySQL. So I'm sure a lot of people here uh, will be using MySQL, so uh, <coughs> hope uh, you'll like this talk. Okay. So uh, let me give a brief introduction of myself before I start. Uh, so uh, my name is Anand. Uh, I'm an independent software consultant and trainer. I'm not a, a, a DBA or database specialist. Uh, I build web applications, and uh, it's hard to think of a web application without a database. So during the course of time, I have worked with both MySQL and uh, uh, Postgres. Postgres. Uh, I worked with uh, 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 fairly large databases, and I've seen uh, uh, issues with both of them. So, uh, and I've uh, kind of uh, started liking Postgres for its simplicity and its uh, advanced features. So I'm going to show you, uh, share some of the insights that I've uh, learned uh, during this time. Okay. So MySQL or Postgres? So Postgres is also called Postgres. So uh, these are two uh, popular open source. There are the two. Uh, open source databases available. And uh, MySQL is most popular. And it actually, uh, the tagline they say is, MySQL is world's most popular open source database, and Postgres is most advanced. So which one do you want to use? Most popular one or most advanced one? OK, so uh, uh, before we actually get into the details, actually, let's uh, a quick comparison of all these things to make sure like we're not comparing apples to apples. OK. so. Uh, MySQL is actually two different databases, actually two different uh, store engines. One is MySQL and uh, InnoDB, and uh, there's Postgres uh, then. So MySQL is a very simple uh, storage engine. It doesn't support transactions. It doesn't support foreign key constraints. And uh, for every write, it locks the entire table. Okay. So it's a very simple uh, model. So for simple operations, it tends to be quite fast. And if you have a read uh, heavy load uh, and not, uh, not complicated queries, my uh, SM tends to be uh, faster usually. And since it's locking uh, the entire table for writes, if you have large write queries, that won't work very well. Okay. And uh, uh, InnoDB is more standard compliant kind of thing, where it supports all the transactions for the constraints. And it has a, a MVCC, the multi-version concurrency control, which means multiple uh, 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 writers can uh, update at the same time. It locks only a row. Okay, so that's a bigger uh, picture of how these things stand. Okay, so if you look at the raw performance of these things, that's probably misleading. Okay, so we're not really trying to compare the raw performance for one particular kind of uh, 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 <coughs> use case, but we're just trying to understand uh, the databases at a more advanced level and then actually see uh, what each one has to offer and then what kind of issues we may face uh, in production. Okay, so who is this MySQL? A lot of people use MySQL, for example. Facebook uses My, uh, uh, MySQL. Friend tree uses, I mean, there are a lot of companies who use MySQL. Okay. So I'm sure like, there are a lot of uh, people who are smarter than me using MySQL. It doesn't mean like, MySQL is a dumb tool. I mean, it has its own use cases. Okay. And same with Postgres. There are a lot of uh, big companies use Postgres. Uh, so it's actually, uh, uh, actually misleading to actually see these names and see that it's better to use. Okay. Because uh, uh, these are big companies and they actually have a lot of resources and actually take any database and then uh, put people and scale it. Okay. So what we should really see is, uh, given the database as it is, okay, as a small team or uh, in a uh, team of what size that we're looking for, uh, can that can we use it? Okay. So what uh, uh, does it offer? Okay. And what are the uh, bottlenecks that it has? Okay. So uh, just using the names of the companies saying they wouldn't really be helpful at all. So I'm going to start with a uh, fun thing about, about MySQL. So first, let's actually talk about why we use a database. So why can't we just use flat files? We don't use flat files because uh, we don't want to worry about a uh, lot of uh, nitty gritties. Okay, so we just want to uh, give data to a database and then ask it to save it. And then once it returns back, we know that data is saved. I don't have to worry about it. Okay, if there are concurrent writes or whatever, uh, it takes care. I send a query, inside query to it, and then if it comes back, I know that my data is saved. I don't have to worry anything else. 
Okay, so that's the confidence that databases gives us. Okay, and apparently MySQL doesn't give it. I mean, not always gives that. Okay, and MySQL sometimes lies to you. Okay, let's look at a small uh, query here. So, I've created a table called Cake uh, with the name varchar3, and I've inserted Pancake into it. What should happen? Like it's a database, you give anything, it saves it, and then when you ask query, it should give you back. Let's see what happens. If you query selects out from cake, you only get it back. Where's the cake? Where's, what happened to my cake? Right? So, actually, MySQL ate your cake. <laughs> but actually, if you have noticed in the previous slide, there is a uh, one warning here saying that the pancake is too long for its store, so it ate the cake and only kept the pan there. So that's not something you would expect from a database. Do you expect something like that from a database? A database is something when I give some data, I expect it to uh, save it as it is. Okay, it's not the only thing, and there are more things with uh, MySQL. Okay, but let's see what happens if we try the same thing with Postgres. It says, uh, "I'm very sorry, uh, I can't handle this thing for you." It says it's an error. Okay. So if MySQL, if Postgres says that it has returned back, that means data is safe. Uh, but uh, in this case, we're using Varka 3 and we're giving a longer one, that gives an error. That's something I can live with. Okay, so immediately I know that it has not accepted that, then I can look at it and find out what happened, okay. But in case of MySQL, if we don't know that these kind of things are happening, it's going to be difficult, because you'll figure out, we'll realize that at a later point and your data would have been lost. Have you ever seen something like this? User table. And uh, it's pretty common to use password as, I'm sorry. Oops. Yeah, so it's pretty common to use password as varchar8. Have you ever seen any website where you log in with a long password and when you, try to, uh, you sign up with a long password when you try to log in, it won't let you in. And if you try with eight characters of the password, it lets you in. Have you ever got, I mean, faced this situation? It actually, uh, actually, it happened with me once with the HDFC Bank uh, foreign <laughs> Forex card website, okay. Well, it's okay, then I realized these guys are using MySQL with Wirecard 8. Okay, so that's something to be very careful about when you're actually using MySQL, because it uh, strips the data if it's longer than that. Okay, and there are also some data conversion errors that happens, we should be aware of, okay. So let's say I created a table uh, with an integer column and I inserted a bad number. What do you expect? It's an integer, but I put a bad number. My SQL says, okay, I've inserted. And actually go back and see, I have a zero. What? Well, what's, so you're supposed to look at the warnings and then see what the warning was, okay. But try doing the same thing with Postgres, it says, sorry, you can't do it. And there are more things, I mean, if you look at uh, dates and try to put a date, it puts 0, 0, uh, 0, 0, et cetera, okay. So there are more uh, uh, quicks like this, but I'm not going to get into all of them, but I'm just pointing some of them. Uh, but actually, uh, there's something, uh, there's some parallels to this, okay. If actually, try the same thing with PHP. Take a bad number and then convert to integer, you get zero, okay. No wonder. PHP gets lost, MySQL. And actually, I tried the same thing in Python, it gives an error. Okay, I'm a Python guy and I feel at home with Postgres. So if you're using, if you like Python style of things, probably should try Postgres. Okay, so that's, that was the fun part. Okay, and uh, this thing can be fixed in MySQL by changing config settings, saying that don't show me warnings, but show errors instead. Uh, that's a small thing, but if you don't know, it actually can actually uh, lead to data loss. It's pretty, uh, pretty dangerous thing. But let's look at uh, 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 more deep things like how these databases store uh, uh, the data in, on the disk and actually see what implications it has on uh, uh, database maintenance and other things. So if you look at, so if you look at MySQL, there are two different uh, uh, engines. We have MySQL and uh, uh, InnoDB. So MySQL stores creates a directory for every database and keeps two files. There's one file for uh, uh, all the tables and one file for all the indexes. 
And if you look at InnoDB, it just keeps all the databases in a single file. Entire, if you have 10 databases, all of them just go into the single file. And there's an option to make this split into per database something, but uh, uh, that's the default thing. If you try uh, Postgres, it's fairly coarse grain. So what it does is, it has one directory per database, and there's one or more files for each table or index. It's actually very, very uh, important, because this uh, has implications on uh, what happens when you try to add index or when you add when you try to add new columns, etc. Uh, also, if you see, uh, since the Postgres has uh, one file for each table and index, let's say you have ten indexes and you're only using two of them, only those two will be loaded into operating system buffer cache and others won't be touched at all. So you won't get the penalty of having so many uh, 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 indexes uh, created. But if you look at um, MySQL, okay, so all of them are sitting in the same file. So probably all these indexes are mixed together uh, in the same file. So when you're loading a disk block, you, you might actually load uh, indexes for all the uh, indexes together. Okay, so probably using only a small fraction of that. So that way, Postgres probably I kind of feel it's very uh, uh, nicely designed in the file structure. Now look at uh, the database maintenance part of it, okay. And what I've seen in the disk layout has actually a lot of implications on the database maintenance. So if you look at how do you create an index with MySQL? So let's look at MySQL. What happens is when you create an index, it locks the entire table for writes and uh, it has to recreate the index file because it's a single index file. It has to create the whole index file. But during this process, you can't write anything. So your database is locked for writes. So you have a write traffic that will max out the number of connections you have, and database will be unusable. Not only that, so when you try to create an index for MySQL, it actually not only creates a, the index file, but also makes a copy of the database file. So you need to actually have a disk, uh, almost like 50% of the disk space free. So that it makes one copy of uh, the uh, table data and one copy of the index. And I don't know for what reason, it actually creates all the indexes from scratch again. So if you have 10 indexes, it's going to take 10x long time. If you have 20, it's going to take 20x long time. So uh, I don't know why, but that's uh, how it works. Okay. And uh, so I used to work at Internet Archive, and uh, uh, where they had a, uh, and if you see create index, if you want to create index, it locks the entire thing. You can't use it, right? So, uh, so at my work uh, at Internet Archive, so there were people who were very scared of data, using databases. They were using MySQL, and uh, uh, the database has been has grown uh, very badly over time, as it happens. Uh, so there was a big table with like 20, 30 columns, and there were a lot of indexes. And they want to add couple. If they want to, uh, they know that a query is running slow. Well, they can't do anything. They had to find workarounds because adding an index will bring down the whole database. So they had to uh, run as a cron job in the night or when the load is low or et cetera. So uh, I looked at it and I thought, let me volunteer to fix this problem. So I said, I'll uh, volunteer to add new columns and new indexes. Okay. So, uh, <coughs> so uh, <coughs> what happened was, uh, since uh, uh <coughs> adding a new index rewrites the whole thing, so first I added new columns. So it rewrote the whole thing. I thought it'd take an hour downtime and planned for one hour downtime. It actually took three and a half hours to uh, re uh, add new columns and then uh, uh, rebuild all the indexes. Then I had to add some new indexes. So it did the whole thing again. So the whole site was down for seven hours. And it was one of the uh, uh, high traffic sites, one of the uh, top 100 sites, and we were down for seven hours because of MySQL. And if you look at, uh, uh, oops. Excuse me. Can someone change the battery? Okay, so in ODB, uh, so, <coughs> Sorry. 
uh, sorry, yeah. <coughs> so, uh, so InnoDB also it used to happen the same way, but uh, uh, I think uh, it has improved in the recent versions. I have not uh, checked the new versions. So even in Postgres, create index locks uh, table for writes. But there is another uh, variant of create index where you can create index concurrently. It doesn't hold the lock for entire duration. It uh, holds the lock for shorter uh, bus. And then, uh, so it's uh, slower than the plain uh, uh, create index. But the nice thing is now, you can actually create index uh, without stopping your operations. That's a really nice thing. Thank you. And uh, also, uh, each index sits in a new file, so it doesn't affect everything else. Same thing for drop index. If you want to drop an index, if you look at my, uh, my SIM, so all the indexes are sitting in a single file. So how will it drop an index? So what it does is it rebuilds the entire file again. So it's going to take the same amount of time as create index. So what you do, you just let the index lie around and, uh, right? So. <coughs> Uh, same thing, uh, so with MySQL, with Postgres, it's just instantaneous because it's just a new file, right? You just have to remove that file and then mark it that the file has been deleted. So that's uh, uh, nice. Okay, so now, uh, see the same thing with adding columns. If you want to add a column, the same thing happens. And with Postgres, uh, adding a new column is almost instantaneous. Okay. <coughs> it's uh, almost instantaneous. if column as a default value. <coughs> so now, this ability to uh, uh, iteratively um, uh, improve, uh, measure database performance and uh, improve the performance by adding index is really nice because you can iteratively uh, uh, try something and then uh, create index and see if that's working or uh, if that's not working, drop the index and try something else, which you won't be able to do with MySQL. Now let's look at the uh, connection model of MySQL and Postgres. So MySQL use threads for each connection. So the nice thing about using threads is creation of threads is very, they're, they're, very, they're less expensive. You can create uh, uh, a thread pretty quickly. But the cons is uh, it's difficult to scale on multi-core systems. One, because of the threads, and second is uh, uh, the implementation of MySQL itself uh, since it's using threads, there are more locks involved. So uh, it won't scale so well on multi-core systems. And it's difficult to monitor threads. They're not like processes, okay? But if you look at Postgres, since it's each a different process, it, they offer better concurrency and there's complete isolation between processes. If one of them is not behaving well, you can just kill them and nothing happens to the rest of the system. It, the other important thing is it plays very nicely with Unix tools. You can look at PS, top, or kill a process, etc. And the cons in the, is a lot of overhead in creating a new connection. So typically use a thread pool or then a server side uh, pooling techniques. Sorry, uh, connection pooling or pooling techniques. I'm just going to show how it looks on top. So if you see, uh, <coughs> this is the, all the process running by Postgres. Okay, so there's one process for uh, writing stuff to a database and there's a uh, val log, etc. Okay, so these are the process that Postgres runs. And if you actually see there, there is a copy command running. Okay. That's probably backup or something, okay. And if you see, that's the PID of the, uh, uh, that's the PID of that uh, uh, connection. Now, uh, let's say I want to build a new index now, and that's going to uh, come on my way. So what I can do is, I can actually kill that process. It's a kill and then give the PID, it'll, it'll just uh, abort the backup process. Or I could even do, kill my stop, that's same as saying control Z. So I can pause the backup process, and then build my index, and then uh, say, rest uh, and then uh, continue that, okay. And there could be even times where uh, uh, there's a, there's a uh, fire fighting and site is slow and uh, database connections have reached too high and uh, it's about to tip off. You just look at the top and see, okay, that connection, is, that uh, uh, query is taking too much of CPU, and that's probably run by one of your colleagues who is not in office right now. So just pause that query and then send a mail saying that when you come back, continue like this and uh, uh, monitor uh, the database. Okay, right. So these kind of things are possible because uh, not because I know Postgres internals because they just plays nicely with the uh, existing Unix tools. 
Now well, let's look at uh, query planning. So I'm going to take this query. So I have a database of uh, names, names of people. Uh, and uh, so I have name, the year, uh, and number of people with the name in that year. So I'm trying to see how this query performs uh, in MySQL and Postgres, I'm trying to understand how this query works. Okay. So if you look at the query plan, there's an explain command. It's explain and give the query. It tells you how the uh, query is being executed in the database. If you look at MySQL, it actually, it's actually one long thing. I broke into two parts to show it here. So it says, uh, it's probably not that clear, so uh, possible key is null, so it couldn't find any key to use, so it's actually going to scan all the rows. So number of rows it's going to scan is this. It's going to use a where condition filter and then use a file sort for sorting it. But if you see, okay, so let's, uh, how do you improve it? You create an index on the total number, and then if you try the same thing, it actually says now that it's using a names total index. It's using index to it, and the number of rows it hits is just 10. That's better, but it, this thing is not uh, that clear. But if, let's try doing the same thing with Postgres, okay? Just take without index. Uh, it says that it's going to do a sequential scan on names, and it's the cost it's involved. So the cost is internal matrix saying that so many operations are required. Uh, and it's going to sequential scan on names table, and then filter by year equal to this. And after that, it's going to sort on the total uh, column, and then limit, and the total cost would be something like this, okay? That's uh, a cost translate, uh, there's a correlation between, sorry? No, that's not number of milliseconds. The cost uh, is an internal uh, uh, number, okay? So that map, there is a correlation between that and the actual time uh, taken. Okay, so now let's create an index and see what happens. Okay, now it says it's actually doing index scan. It's index scan backwards because we are uh, finding uh, the top names in the tier. So uh, it has to come backwards from the index and then filter by this year. Okay, you could even do uh, explain analyze. And since it'll actually run the query and actually tells you how it performed. You could actually say it actually remo was removed by the filter is so and so and it took so and so time. Okay, so if you see the actual time took is this. And uh, the, uh, the cost uh, does, doesn't transfer directly to it, but actually there's some proportion to that, okay? So uh, this is nice because you can actually see how a query is being executed and actually see it's using the right index or not, or, uh, and then uh, add new index, remove index, and then tweak these queries. If you try a bit complex query, I um, added a, a group by here. So it's actually doing pretty complicated query plan. So it's actually doing a bitmap index scan. What's a bitmap scan? Is a, it creates a bitmap, it's a one bit for each row, and then fills it with zeros, and then goes over this, and then the, if this condition is true, then it puts ones in that, and then uh, it uh, takes uh, all the rows where there's one, and then goes over the names, and then aggregates that, and then sorts it by that key. Okay, so uh, Postgres can do this kind of uh, fairly advanced queries. And I think um, uh, surely Postgres uh, uh, has an upper hand in uh, executing complex queries. Okay, so that's uh, about uh, the query planning. Now let's uh, <coughs> uh, look at uh, how replication works in both MySQL and Postgres. So MySQL has uh, actually a variety of ref replication modes. So uh, uh, you can replicate by statement or by row, and there's a combination of that. You can actually, the different modes, whether it writes a binary log and then replace that, or there's something called uh, a global transaction ID. So each one of them has some limitations, doesn't uh, uh, replicate completely. I mean, so for example, if you look at statement-based uh, replication, uh, there are some queries in Postgres which are undeterministic. You can actually say update something and say limit to. That means you update, rows, but only update the first two rows. Which first two rows? If you don't have an order specified, it can update any random two rows in the database. Okay. Now, uh, uh, if the same thing is applied uh, on a slave, it could update two different rows. Okay. So, uh, I find uh, the options uh, that offer are pretty confusing, and the row base, there are some limitations as well. Okay. Uh, but if you look at Postgres, it's pretty simple and straightforward. Okay. So, what it does is, uh, it maintains something called a val log, right head log. So whenever a disk block is modified in Postgres, it's written to a right head log, and that gets uh, replayed. 
So uh, this is at the disk block level, not at the database level. It's a low level below. So what it does is uh, it takes a disk block and uh, applies uh, on the uh, disk uh, at the slave. So there are two modes, synchronous and asynchronous. When you do synchronous mode, what it does is uh, the master waits until the transaction is committed on the slave. Asynchronous, it will uh, leave a small delay. And there are two modes of doing it. One is log shipping. You take the val file and then send it to a slave and then do a replication. Or uh, uh, you can actually use the database to stream it uh, over network. And then slave can again uh, uh, replicate to other slaves. So that's how replication works in Postgres. So let's look at uh, uh, data recovery uh, in uh, Postgres. Uh, so MySQL have not showed uh, uh, what kind of things you can recover, okay, because uh, they don't, I don't think it has any uh, 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 measures like this. Okay, so Postgres, I said, has a right head log. So the, uh, once you take a base backup of database, you take a rsync of the whole uh, uh, Postgres database, and then get the while files, it applies there. Okay. So what you can do is, let's say you have, by mistake, did a, deleted some rows. You actually wanted to replay back up to a couple of minutes before that. What you can do is you can actually copy all the while files, and then uh, say that uh, replay up to this timestamp. You can actually come up to that and it stops there. So you actually really have a time machine of entire database. You can actually go back like one day back, or two days back, three days back, or actually one day, five minutes, or you can specify timestamp, it goes and stops there. That's a pretty nice feature, okay. So if you have crashed your database or did something nasty, just can roll back just uh, the moment before that. So that's the comparison I have, and let me show you some quickly some of the interesting features of Postgres. So there is a, there's something called partial index. You can say that create index only if some condition is true. For example, uh, there are some queries which are running pretty slow. You want to f optimize that, and you don't have time to like uh, spend time to change your code. But let's say there's a uh, query like that where email is like percent spam.com that's taking 10 seconds to run. You want to make it fast. Just create an index where email is percent spam.com. Okay, so it'll actually use that index. So you can actually have the where conditions uh, in uh, uh, creating index itself. You can have functional indexes. You can actually use a function in creating index. Uh, <coughs> so if you have a query which uses functions in where clause or group by, et cetera, you could actually say create an index on that, so it'll use that index for that query. And uh, the new uh, document database buzz. So uh, Postgres has a JSON data type. You can actually create a data a JSON and actually create a JSON blob into the table. And you can even uh, query with that, and so data where author is marked when give me all the books. You can actually get that. So they have a JSON and JSONB both. So JSONB uh, is supposed to be binary format and provides uh, a little more uh, features. And JSON was, I think, added in 9.3 and JSONB added in 9.4 or something. Yeah, both of them pretty much do something and JSONB has more features. Okay, but if you see this, uh, if you look at the document databases or semi-structured data, you could just use Postgres. You don't have to go out and use something like MongoDB or something. You can just do everything in your uh, same relational database and still get the flexibility. And this is another beautiful thing is uh, there is some extension called PG stat statements. You can actually, uh, this keeps on logging all the queries, how much time it took. You can actually find out what are the queries that are taking most time. So uh, total time by number of calls as T, and then you uh, order by T. So it's actually telling me uh, it took so much time, uh, and it called three times. And this is a query that I need to optimize. And the next query is this. So these are the, the bottlenecks in my database, and now I can go back and create index and uh, uh, try to optimize them, okay? So that's what I have to say, and that's the summary, okay? Uh, <coughs> so I think uh, Postgres is better than MySQL in data consistency, like I showed in the first slide, and query planning, stability, database maintenance, and data recovery, okay? So uh, I'm sure like there are cases where MySQL runs faster and uh, uh, useful, but I think in, for, uh, uh, if considering the advanced feature, it's worth trying Postgres for your next project. Do you agree? Okay, so uh, credits for the image Postgres logo that I've used, and thanks, and I'm open for questions. Uh, hi. Uh, hi. Uh, 
as much. Yeah. Uh, one of the uh, uh, things that people would pick uh, MySQL for is that of the PHP MySQL. Uh, that PHP MySQL allows you to see in a in a web page. You know, you don't have to have a, a, a machine to actually see your database and everything. What is the is there something like that on the PG as well? Sorry, uh, and could you play, uh, in the PHP MySQL? Uh, yeah, so there is something called the PHP MySQL that allows you to see how the database is and do all the database operations on your web instead so of a client. Uh, okay. I think you're talking about uh, PHP MyAdmin, yes. right? Yes, PHP MyAdmin, yes. Okay, so uh, uh, there's something called PG MyAdmin as well. Okay. So you could still do You can do the same kind yeah. of things. Okay. Uh, uh, Um, hi, uh, yeah. I have one more question. This is uh, specifically on Postgres. So in Postgres, um, uh, we are actually trying to do a dump and load for every uh, newer version of Postgres. We are trying to avoid that. And we realize that there is this replication op option available uh, um, uh, recently in 9.3. Is there a way to really do this uh, in the older versions of uh, Postgres? Say again, so streaming replication, is it? Sorry? No, what, what you're trying to do? Replication, replication. Uh, for inst the DB upgrade, basically. Uh, so okay. if you want to really do a DB so upgrade, version, you have to do a dump Which version load, of Postgres right? are you using? Uh, 9.2 is what we have. OK, so the, all the major versions are version uh, uh, format compatible. So from 9.2 to 9.3, you should be able to uh, do the replication. OK. So I think you can do uh, streaming replication from 9.2 to 9.3. OK. But still, but you won't it, be able to the do document nine. actually says that it's not supported. I don't know for what reason. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm not sure. I've not tried that. But what you could try is, uh, so there are two ways of doing replication. One is streaming replication because that, that uh, uh, copies over the wire. Second is uh, uh, <coughs> log shipping replication. So you take the WAL files and then put it uh, in the directory. Okay, so periodically you are sync uh, it to the slave machine and then it replaces there. Okay. That's something you can try. Okay. So there's something on archive command. Okay, so uh, when uh, the log files reaches a number of limit, it calls archive command and then copies. The archive command decides how it wants to copy. So you can use that to send those files to the slave. And send cl and slave can replay it. Uh, we actually learned that uh, we actually yeah. learned that streaming is not supported in 9.2. No, so streaming replication is supported from 9.0. Okay. So A, Postgres A doesn't have streaming replication, but uh, from 9, they have streaming replication. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Here, here. Can, I can't see you. Here, can you, can you see it? Yeah. OK. Uh, we have one question. Like, uh, does PostgreSQL support default failover mechanism or any options for high availability? Uh, could you please repeat the question? Does PostgreSQL support uh, failover mechanism? Default, does it have any failover mechanism yes. by default? Yes, so streaming replication is what you use for high availability. Uh, so okay. there, there are two, way, uh, two way, uh, modes. One is streaming, uh, one is uh, synchronous and asynchronous. If you use synchronous uh, replication, then uh, every update that happens to master, it makes sure the slave also got the copy. OK, uh, but how do we main, uh, set up a high availability? With, uh, like, if a, master goes down, we have to manually bring up the slave, right? OK, so there are some tools to actually uh, automatically do that, but I have not worked on that. So I think people use something called PG Bouncer or something, but actually that sits before the database, and then that can decide which database to connect to. OK, uh, like is there any possibility to set up a replication like uh, synchronous between one master to slave and an asynchronous between the the slave one to slave two? Yes, I've already showed that because so you, you could you could do uh, uh, ca that's called cascading replication. So there's one master to slave, and then slave can replicate to other slaves. Uh, we felt actually like when we do a synchronous replication from uh, one master to slave, it was a bit slow. Like it was still waiting for the slave to complete it. But in the slave, when we checked it, the query didn't get completed actually. Uh, uh, okay, so. Um, well, uh, I'm not sure. So, so the synchronous replication is will be slower because uh, the slave has to acknowledge back saying that it has completed that operation. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Hello. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, couple of questions. First, 
Uh, which versions of uh, MySQL did you uh, take into account while comparing the features? Because so uh, so my SIM, uh, I've actually tested with the latest version that comes with uh, Ubuntu 15.04. I think that's 5.6. Mm -hmm. So in ODB, uh, I've not done this test. Some of the experiments were done in 5.5 something. Mm -hmm. And you uh, didn't test uh, the, the Percona binaries or the MariaDB binaries? Uh, no. Okay. Okay. And second question on the Postgre side. Uh, uh, want to know what are the sharding? Uh, are there any sharding features uh, which are by default supported, or you have to build a layer upfront? Okay. Sh so sh uh, I'm not sure. So you can actually share it to multiple tables or across multiple databases. Yeah. Uh, multiple hosts uh, having okay. uh, a, a chunk of data. Let's, let's say. One so I don't think so. So, uh, so Postgres usually. Uh, uh, as the stand is anything that goes to Postgres score mm. uh, is very well tested and it's going to be like a rock solid feature. Okay, mm. so the kind of things that are experimental kind of things comes as external tools. Okay, mm -hmm. so for example, replication has been around as a third party tools from quite long time, but it took so long time to come into Postgres. Uh, similarly, there, so there are some tools which actually does all these things as an external uh, uh, application. So they sit in front of the database and then they take care of doing that uh, doing that thing. Okay. Comparable to MySQL fabric kind of thing. Oh, well, so I've never worked with MySQL uh, this thing. Okay. Okay. In thanks. Front of that. Hello. Can you hear me here? Yeah. Hello, Anand. Yeah. Excuse me. Here, here, here. Here. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we have been using PG SQL for a long time, but. Uh, we don't know what is the clustering solution for PG SQL to have a master master kind of a node similar to MySQL clustering. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure. So uh, I don't think Postgres has master to master replication. No, you're talking about master and master replication. What I'm talking about is a cluster, like how MySQL gives a cluster software itself. Okay. M like MariaDB cluster. Okay. Yeah. So I'm asking what is the uh, so I, I'm not sure what my s cluster does other than uh, doing the replication. Is anything a special? cluster can give you a good HA and uh, load balancing as well. Okay. In terms of, uh, uh, say, for example, a cluster is having A and B node, and you can just push one statement to A and one another SQL statement to B. Okay. And uh, um, yeah. So I, I, I don't think Postgres uh, supports something uh, out of the box like that. Okay. okay. So there are commercial extensions to Postgres, like Enterprise JB, and they might be supporting something like that, but I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you. Because that is a big talk in terms of scalability of nodes. Okay. Um, when we need to, uh, when we don't need to scale up, but we d we want to scale out. Okay. Thank you. Hey. Uh, here, here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I have a s couple of questions on the comparisons that you made between MySQL okay. and Postgres. So uh, I'm not sure which versions of MySQL you compared, but MySQL has a fast index creation that doesn't take lock on InnoDB. So it doesn't take lock on if you are using InnoDB engine. Okay. So, so that's what I mentioned. So uh, the version that came with 14.04, okay, had this issue. Okay. But uh, probably the new version got fixed. Okay, I've not tried on new uh, No, I think I'm talking about at least two years ago. Like uh, MySQL had uh, fast index creation when you started using InnoDB Engine 1.1. 1 .1. Okay. That's a one part. Other part is that okay, MySQL 5.6 has a GTID based replication. Okay. So you can use GTID. Okay. And I think the friends that people were talking about the uh, high availability and and the um, true multi master uh, setup. Okay. So MySQL has a Galera replication. That's a true multi-master replication with the synchronous uh, uh, replication. Okay. So uh, let me add one. See, the thing is, uh, with Postgres, uh, when I uh, see it's working, it's, it's, I'm pretty much confident that it's working. It's working. Okay. With MySQL, there are a uh, lot of quicks. For example, if you use a replication, okay, uh, the replication could go out of sync, and you wouldn't even know. The kind of things. Happen with MySQL. But so how you can make sure, even if you are using uh, uh, Postgres, I, yeah. uh, by the way, Postgres is a good standalone database, by the way. Yeah. I agree that okay, Postgres has some features that is, if you are using as a standalone database, okay. it really outperforms the MySQL. Okay. But when it comes to reliability and availability with the scaling, okay. then there I feel that okay, my, uh, Postgres really fails in terms of replication is still, it is in a ca catch up mode. 
plus also it doesn't come with the uh, proxy mechanisms like now uh, coming with the mariadb uh, max scale has come or like scale proxy has come right where okay. you can actually do the sharding and the uh, uh, load balancing by using the scale proxy and you can you uh, rebalance the read and writes across the cluster. So I think so. Even if for Postgres, there are third-party tools which will provide that. That's not part of the core Postgres. A agreed. But now I think the tools that are building on top of MySQL is po more about a on top of the MySQL core. Okay. So I think that makes more sense to understand because you have to understand the replication technology as well. Okay. Like your proxy has to be aware how which kind of replication is. Are mm -hmm. you using synchronous or asynchronous? If there is a deterministic query, is how where it should go. Okay. So I think that becomes more compelling. Like that's why I feel that okay, people are using MySQL more as compared to Postgres when it really goes. And uh, let's talk about the multi-data center application. People are have facing a problems, right? Okay. No. So the thing is, uh, uh, so uh, I won't be able to answer the question of multi-data center things because I've never worked on such a large scale. But uh, uh, I'm sure like uh, Skype is using uh, Postgres and they're trying to reach 1 billion operations per second. Okay, so they're scaling out uh, like that. Okay, so I'm sure like Postgres is also possible to do it. Okay, but uh, it's not that uh, I can answer that question. Okay, how so it's last done. thing that like you said, okay, Postgres does the consistency of the replication, right? Yeah. How do you really make sure? Like MySQL, there are there were problems obviously. So like MySQL, like Percona guys have built up uh, checksum tools where you can compare the row by row uh, data between the master and slave, and that that's how you guarantee that okay the uh, slave has the data as master. Okay. How you guarantee the same thing into Postgres? Okay, so let me actually uh, give a brief uh, history of like how Postgres and uh, the design philosophies of between Postgres and MySQL. Okay, so MySQL started as to build a fast database server. Okay, and Postgres started as a uh, standard compliance uh, uh, complete database server. Okay, so uh, the adoption of MySQL has been uh, to make sure things which are only standard that goes into MySQL and only when stable things. And um, sorry, with Postgres, with MySQL, uh, uh, the concern was not about meeting standards, but actually making something uh, that fast and practical more people can use. Okay, so so MySQL has come a uh, long way. Uh, uh, to meet all the standards and Postgres come a long way to become faster. Excuse me, let me just me just take uh, down this. Yeah. We have a database buff at three, so you can take so, all these questions to the database. Can I finish this question? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, uh, so so with Postgres, uh, uh, if something goes into Postgres, it's fairly, uh, you can be confident that uh, it's not going to fail. So, um, so if, 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 uh, if there is some error, it actually stop there, it won't actually continue replicating, it will stop replicating there. But with MySQL, it will actually continue doing it and you have to use these tools to figure that out. No, no, so, uh, so it, it maintains checksum for every uh, a val file. And it it uh, checks that, and so if it gets a val file, it's not matching. It won't be. It it'll, it won't replicate. It'll stop there. No, no. So my Postgres doesn't do role level operation. It does the block level. Shall we take the question offline? Uh, I think it's.